In the quietest corners of American wilderness, far from paved roads and phone signals, there exists a geological pattern so consistent that geologists almost treat it as a coded message from the Earth itself. A message written in stone, whispered through time, and understood only by those who know how to read the land. They call it the Three Rock Combination, a natural lineup of minerals and textures so tightly connected to gold that whenever these three appear together, the likelihood of gold rises from possibility to near certainty. Most people walk through valleys and stream beds without noticing the clues lying at their feet. But gold is never random. It never scatters without logic, and it never travels alone. It forms, moves, and settles according to precise geological laws. Laws that leave unmistakable signatures behind. These signatures aren't obvious. They don't shine, they don't sparkle, and they don't call attention to themselves. But geologists have learned to recognize them as the silent fingerprints of ancient gold movement. And today, you will learn to recognize them too. Gold begins deep underground, born from mineral-rich fluids rising from molten rock far beneath the crust. As pressure builds and temperatures soar, microscopic particles of gold dissolve into superheated water, drifting upward through cracks, fractures, and faults. And as the planet cools those fluids, gold begins to precipitate out, sticking to the edges of the fractures, coating quartz veins, pooling inside breaks in the bedrock. This entire process leaves behind companions, rocks and minerals that form under the exact same conditions. When you understand these companions, you understand the entire golden trail. The first of these geological companions is a type of metamorphic rock that looks as though it has been pressed, heated, and folded by the weight of the continents themselves. Smooth, shiny, layered, and often glittering with mica, this rock records ancient heat and pressure stronger than nearly anything on the surface today. Geologists rely on it because this type of rock forms in the exact environment where gold-bearing fluids originate. It is schist, one of the most respected host rocks in American gold geology. Whenever you step into a region where schist appears, especially in mountain belts stretching from the Appalachians to the Rockies, you stand inside a zone shaped by the very same forces that produce gold. But schist alone isn't the signal. Gold needs a highway, something that carried the fluids upward and froze them in place. And for millions of years, that highway has been quartz. Thick white or translucent quartz veins cut through darker rock like frozen lightning. They slice across schist, granite, basalt, and almost anything in their path. When hydrothermal fluids carrying gold cooled inside these veins, they left behind crystals, fractures, iron staining, and sometimes visible flakes of precious metal frozen in time. Even the rusty orange-red stains that coat quartz in gold country tell a story. They signal iron oxidation, nature's way of marking the path of mineralization. Where quartz cuts through schist, the story of gold becomes clearer. But the real confirmation appears in a third rock, an often overlooked heavy, rusty, metallic stone that forms at the surface when iron-rich minerals weather. It can appear deep brown, jet black, or blood red, and it leaves stains on anything it touches. This stone is ironstone, the unmistakable marker of a hydrothermal system that once pulsed with mineral-rich fluids. Gossan caps, iron crusts, limonite masses, and hematite-laced stones are nature's final stamp of approval. They say, yes, the chemistry, the temperature, and the fluids that create gold were here. When schist provides the birthplace, quartz provides the pathway, and ironstone reveals the chemical transformation. The three-rock combination is complete, not a myth, not a rumor.
A geological pattern repeated across the United States wherever gold has been historically and scientifically confirmed. From the Sierra Nevada range to the Georgia Gold Belt, from Arizona's iron-rich ridges to Colorado's metamorphic cores, from the river-cut canyons of Oregon to the ancient schist belts of Alaska, this trio appears with remarkable consistency. Finding these three rocks is like reading a coded map. First, you notice the schist, layered, glittery, easily split, shaped by immense heat. You run your hand across its surface and feel the grain of an ancient world. Then you notice the quartz, bright white, jagged, cutting across a darker rock like veins of frozen sunlight. And finally, the ironstone, heavy, metallic, oxidized, a deep, rusty color that stands out even in the shade. These rocks are not random. Their presence together is a geological conversation and each stone adds a layer of meaning. Gold hunters, prospectors, and professional geologists use this combination in the field without fanfare. They know that if schist and quartz appear together, the ground has history. But when ironstone joins the scene, the ground has potential. And when all three appear within walking distance, sometimes even within arm's reach, you have stepped into a zone where gold once moved, gathered, and concentrated. This is the exact method used in American exploration. Locating metamorphic host rocks, tracing the quartz veins that fracture them, and studying the oxidized ironstone that reveals the age of the system. Companies invest millions in drilling programs based on this geological triangle. Prospectors stake claims on ridges where these rocks intersect. And ordinary people, those who understand these quiet clues, find gold in places others overlook. When you walk into a landscape with these three rocks, you begin to see the world differently. Hills that once looked ordinary now appear as chapters in an ancient story. River bends become pathways that once carried broken quartz downhill. Rust-colored ridges become signposts pointing toward old veins. Even the gravel beneath your feet becomes a record of erosion, carrying fragments of the very rocks connected to gold. The power of the three rock combination is not just scientific, it is practical. It tells you where to look, how to interpret the land, and where gold is most likely to be trapped today. It teaches you that gold does not scatter randomly, but follows rock types, structures, and chemistry. And once you understand those patterns, you can predict where gold should be, even in places you've never explored before. Whenever you find yourself in a canyon, along a creek, or on a lonely mountainside in the American West or East, and you notice these rocks around you, schist whispering of deep origins, quartz marking the pathways of ancient fluids, and ironstone confirming the mineralizing conditions. Stop for a moment, look around, listen to the silence, because you may be standing on the threshold of an area where nature once hid gold with deliberate precision and the landscape around you is quietly waiting for someone observant enough to interpret it. The truth is that gold rarely reveals itself easily, but it leaves unmistakable hints in the rocks that accompany it. When you know how to read these hints, the wilderness becomes a geological map rather than a mystery. And this second part of the story begins with understanding what happens next, how to follow these rocks, how to interpret their placement, and how to transform geological clues into real discovery. Once you identify schist, quartz, and ironstone in the same environment, the next step is to determine how these rocks relate to each other. Geologists are trained to look for alignment, orientation, and the way veins intersect the host rock. When quartz veins cut across schist in clean, sharp lines, it means those veins likely formed during a period of intense hydrothermal activity. 
And hydrothermal activity is the engine of gold formation. These veins can run uphill, downhill, or across a slope, but they usually align with old fault structures, cracks in the earth that once served as pathways for mineral-rich fluids. By following the direction of the vein, you essentially trace the path that gold-bearing fluids once traveled. Ironstone plays an even more important role at this stage. Its presence does not just confirm mineralization, it reveals the age and exposure of the system. Ironstone typically forms when sulfide minerals weather and oxidize at the surface, which means the area you're standing in has undergone long periods of erosion. When these oxidized caps sit above quartz veins, they often point toward deeper, unweathered sections where gold can remain locked inside the rock. This is why some of America's richest gold finds have been made just beneath iron-rich hilltops. The rusty color is not just a stain, it is a sign of ancient chemical transformation. As you walk along slopes or creek beds in the United States, you may notice that these rocks appear in clusters. This clustering is not accidental. Water, gravity, and erosion naturally concentrate the fragments of these rocks together, especially near old volcanic belts and metamorphic terrains. When all three appear in creek gravels, it often means the original source is nearby, uphill or upstream. This is one of the most important clues prospectors use. Rocks always travel downhill, and gold, being heavier than nearly everything around it, tends to settle in predictable traps. So if you find these rocks together in a waterway, the next step is to trace their origin. Tracing uphill from a creek, following the fragments of schist and quartz, often leads you to the bedrock exposures where the original veins remain frozen in place. Along the way, iron stones scattered across slopes confirms that the ground has undergone oxidation and mineralization. Every rusty fragment you touch is part of a chain of evidence stretching back millions of years. And as the rocks become larger, more angular, and more freshly broken, you know you're getting closer to the source. American geologists often refer to this approach as reading the land because the terrain itself is the text the shape of the valley the tilt of the hillside the position of old boulder fields all carry meaning gold bearing areas frequently appear where steep slopes flatten where ridges intersect like braided threads or where old river channels change direction long ago if the three rock combination appears in these zones the probability of gold increases dramatically. Many of the best modern gold discoveries in the United States weren't found by accident. They were found by people who understood how to interpret rock combinations and follow them back to their origins. And it is here where the process becomes almost meditative. You take your time, you slow your steps. You observe the ground with calm curiosity the wilderness becomes a quiet teacher. Small details begin to stand out. The sound of crunching iron-rich gravel under your boots. The distinct shimmer of mica from schist in the afternoon sun. The glint of white quartz between broken stones. You begin to sense a pattern. The environment feels mineralized, as if the land itself still remembers the ancient pressure, heat, in geological violence that once shaped it. When you reach the source area, whether it's a ridge, a hillside, or a bedrock exposure, you'll often notice the rocks aligning in a way that tells a story. Quartz veins may widen, ironstone patches may intensify, and schist layers may twist and fold in dramatic patterns. Sometimes you find broken quartz scattered downhill from a vein exposed high above. Other times you see rusty staining on the face of a rock wall, indicating that sulfide minerals once lurked inside. If you examine these surfaces closely, 
you may notice tiny fractures where gold once moved. Even if the gold is not visible, the structure of the rock carries the memory of mineralizing fluids. And this brings us to one of the most powerful techniques geologists use, examining contact zones. A contact zone is where two different rock types meet, such as the boundary between schist and quartz. These boundaries are prime locations for gold deposition because the change in chemistry and pressure often cause gold to drop out of solution. When quartz veins cut through schist and ironstone coats the edges of those veins, the chances of gold increase significantly. Many American gold mines began at these exact boundaries, but gold is rarely found at the surface. It is usually locked inside the quartz veins, trapped in fissures, resting in cracks in the bedrock, or broken off and carried into nearby waterways. This is why panning in areas with the three rock combination is so effective. If gold has eroded from the veins, it will settle into natural traps behind large stones, inside cracks in the bedrock, beneath dense gravel layers, and in places where fast water suddenly slows down. These traps exist everywhere from Alaskan streams to Appalachian rivers. And because gold is so heavy, once it settles, it tends to stay put until major floods move it again. 